for this. How are y'all doing? Uh, awesome, awesome. So we are going to um, have a little, we're going to continue our series, Making It Fun, Adding Joy to the Journey. Anybody in here need a little extra fun in your life? Anybody in here need a little extra fun? Anybody in here feel like you're the person who always brings the party? I'm looking at some of y'all over there. Uh, Y'all are always bringing the party, and I love it. I love it. So we're going to talk this morning about continuing to add joy to the journey, continuing to add joy to our lives. And so one thing that was really surprising to me this week as I was studying about joy was how the people in the Old Testament had these mandatory feasts. So there were these special times, like eight different times of the year, the Passover feast, the Feast of the Tents, like all these different feasts that they had. They had this mandatory time of feast and celebration. And I read about them all this week, and what I expected to hear was some people were like, you know, we're just a little too busy to come to the party. Anybody felt like that this week? I just got a little too much going on in my life to have fun this week. You know, like, guess what? They didn't get to say that. Their expectation was they showed up to eat a feast and to party, to have a celebration. They, they didn't get to say, um, you know, it's been the hardest week of my life this past week. God was like, all right, we're still going to have a feast, right? We're still going to come together and have this giant praise party. It wasn't an invitation where you could politely decline in your RSVP, okay? It wasn't one of those. It was a command of God, a commandment to feast, to celebrate, and to have fun. There were no excuses. You could never be too busy. It was party time, okay? Y'all, I want to read about one of these to you. It's in Nehemiah chapter 8. And before, before you're like, oh, okay, they got together and had a party because things were great in their lives, that's not what's happening. The people lived in exile. That means they had been kicked out of the promised land. They lived in Babylon. They'd been oppressed. They had been treated terrible. They didn't get to eat the food they liked. There was no rights there that they could go and have cake and their comfort food sandwich on a Saturday. This was not the kind of life that they were living. They had been completely put out into exile, and they came back to the holy city that they lived in, Jerusalem, and it was destroyed. Everything they knew and loved was laying in rubble. The life they built, the city they helped build, all of it was laying in ruin. And this is what happens. A man named Ezra... Okay, it's time to have this feast. They don't get to say, we don't have a building to party in. I know this. I've told God this. God, we don't have a building to party in. And you know what he says? Party anyway. Have worship and worship God anyway. Were you all here a couple weeks ago when we didn't have a sound system? It wasn't an excuse, right? We still came here and we still worshiped God. So Ezra, all these people have come from all different parts of the city and they have come to hear him speak And Ezra opened the book. Ezra opened the book, just like I did this morning. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. He was a little bit elevated. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. They'd come to the festival. They'd come to feast. They were all sitting down with their families. He opened the book. And the people all stood up. And in the middle of ruin and destruction, in the middle of pain and heartache, being right in front of their face, Ezra praised the Lord. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And the people, all the people who were living in tents, and makeshift houses, all of those people lifted their hands because they had nothing else to offer God. They lifted their hands and they responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Ezra opened the book. You want a formula for joy? When's the last time you 
you joyfully opened the Bible to read a few verses from it. Ezra opened the book, a book of the commands and law of the Lord. He opened it up and the people stood up. They could no longer contain their joy and their thanksgiving. They did something different. They stood up. Ezra praised the Lord. People lifted their bodies, put their hands in the air, and they all shouted, Amen, Amen, Amen. It was loud and chaotic and kind of crazy. It was my kind of church. It was noisy. It was interactive. People didn't stand there and listen to just Ezra read from the book. They said amen. They joined in. They had some things to say. Y'all are not getting the point here. It was interactive, right? <laughs> they, they laughed. They expressed themselves. It was joyful. Thank you. Thank you. It was joyful. It was festive. He says this day is holy. Holy means set apart. This day is holy. Do not mourn. Or weep. Do not mourn or weep. It's not, I think so often I think of holy, and I'll be really honest with you, I think holy is like this super solemn, somber, let's do everything right and quiet and super reverent. But but Ezra said something different, right? We've lived in a land where we have mourned and weeped for a really long time. And I am asking you. To recognize that this day, this feast is set apart and it is holy. In this time, there was a tradition called lament. It was originally like created so that people could be honest about the brokenness and pain in their lives and in the world. They lamented. They were honest about the fact there was hurt and pain and brokenness. And that allowed them to experience joy in a deeper and more profound way. But like us humans do so often, it became more about the lamenting and less about the joy and goodness of God. People got all hung up in the brokenness and the evil and the pain and the crying and the weeping and they just started living really miserable lives. Anybody know that? Right? The human condition is still the same. It doesn't take long for us to go down a rabbit hole and figure out everything wrong in the world and think we are helpless and hopeless and have no solution to it. And Ezra's speaking against this tradition, this tradition of constantly crying, weeping, complaining, and grumbling. He says, it, now is the time for good food and good drinks, for people to have fun, for people to enjoy, enjoy things. And then, this is my favorite part, y'all. This is my very favorite part. He says, we are sitting in the middle of rubble. Ezra tells him this. We're sitting in the middle of rubble and destruction. And yet, and yet we will praise the Lord. But to praise the Lord, we're not going to sit here in this rubble ourselves. You know somebody that you walked past on the way to sit here in this festival who is hungry. You know somebody who doesn't have a meaningful relationship in their life. You know somebody who's dealing with sickness or pain or hurt, and they couldn't even bring themselves to sit in the rubble and celebrate with us. Go get them, Ezra says. Go get them. The celebration is going to be better if they're here. So the people go and get them, and they come back, and y'all want to know, y'all want to know something? My biggest fear at birthday parties that I plan for my kids is there's not going to be enough food, there's not going to be enough party favors, there's not, there was enough. Because at the party that God throws for us, there is always enough, especially for those who lack everything. Especially for those who lack everything. You see why this day is holy and set apart? It's just like our God. He says, don't grieve. They didn't look at Ezra and say, you don't understand. You don't understand what I've dealt with this, Lord, this, this week, Lord. And I didn't put it in here. But Ezra looks at the people. He looks at the people and he says, we are sitting in ruin. We are sitting here with empty hands. All we can do is put them up and praise the Lord and say amen. Because, listen to this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you're weak and exhausted, tired, and, and, and you feel like your life is just a bunch of rubble on the ground, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He told them, everywhere in the world, 
Everywhere that you turn right now, you feel like somebody is asking you to choose between joy or building the, rebuilding this wall and rebuilding this city. Everywhere you turn, folks, these words are fresh on us just like they were thousands of years ago for the people. Everywhere you turn, somebody's asking you to fix something, to acknowledge the brokenness and pain of something, to, to get caught up in lamenting and worrying and complaining and grumbling. Everyone is asking you to choose between that or joy. People ask you, go to work or have fun, right? We work during the week so we can play on the weekends. And, and Ezra says, that's not, that's not joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. When we rebuild this wall, we will have joy as we work brick by brick by brick. As you serve God, you will have joy. He's not, Ezra's not saying to them, like, you're going to show up and set up this screen. Y'all, it is the worst thing to set up. I love Jesus. I love worshiping Him. I love praising Him. But that screen right there, can I get an amen? It's terrible to put up. But God's not asking us to focus in that. He's not saying you can set the screen up and then have joy a little later on in the worship service. We laughed till we cried setting that thing up because we're weak. We can't even snap snaps on there. And it made Abby and I laugh at each other, right? When Justice is here, it makes us laugh even harder. He's nine and he can do it a lot better than us. But that's what I'm saying to you guys, okay? That Ezra's not asking you when you get up in the morning and you go to work. Ezra is saying, God, the world is going to say to you, you've got to choose between work or joy. I'm saying to you that we have these feasts, that we come every single Sunday morning to enjoy the joy of the Lord so that we walk into work on Monday morning with joy in our hearts, that we have joy on Sunday mornings. The people who help uh, Kate in her in Horizon Kids over there, they have joy as they help the kids. It's not only existent in some special way. The joy of the Lord happens as we serve Him. I... I'm going to read Psalm 100 for us, if I can find it in my Bible. Psalm 100, if you are ready to have this kind of joy in your life, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what it is. First of all, hold on, before you go there, can we do the what joy is not? Okay, <laughs> thank you for hanging out with me. Can we give him a round of applause? He hangs with me every Sunday. This is like my sermon notes, and I don't have enough copies for him because I write it down, and he just hangs with me, and I appreciate it. Thank you for joyfully working that job every Sunday. All right, joy is not a denial that life is hard. Ezra said, I'm not asking you to pretend like we're sitting, we're not sitting in the middle of rubble. I'm not asking you this morning to not pretend like your life, you, some of you may be sitting in the middle of a pile of rubble. I'm not asking you to pretend like that is not your reality. I'm saying joy does not live in denial that life is hard. Joy does not do that. Joy is not this idealistic Pollyanna approach to life that believes life is easy. We go around and just push the easy button on everything. That, and that's what's going to make life fun. That is not what joy is. Joy is not that. Joy is not controlling organized, anti-chaotic way of living life. Sometimes it's noisy. Sometimes it's a little wiggly, you know. We've got some kids in here that have, that my, mine is in here. Um, so it just is what it, it is, right? Um, it's not this controlled, anti-chaotic way of living. Listen to what David, a, a king who knew what it was like to sit in the middle of a pile of rubble, right? He did some really awful, terrible things in his life. He got another woman pregnant, killed her husband, like went to war with his country over this craziness. Like he was not a good, like perfect guy, but he served God. And this is what he says. This is what he says that he learned about looking at the rubble of his life and realizing God could still do something. He tells people just like us, shout for joy to the Lord. When's the last time you shouted for joy to the Lord? It makes you feel good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. So some of y'all are sitting there like, I'm not, a, I'm not a shouting kind of person. No, all the earth, you're included. All of y'all need to be shouting for joy. Worship the Lord with gladness. This should be one of your favorite things you do all week is come to Sunday morning worship. Um, 
Come before him with joyful songs. We sang some joyful songs to him this morning, right? Know that, listen, this is a recipe for joy. Know that the Lord is God. Your job isn't God. Your family isn't God. Your perfect car, perfect... None of those things are God. The Lord is God. It is He who made you. Your job didn't make you. Your family, I love them, but they didn't make you. God made you. And you are His. We are His. We are His people. The sheep of His pasture. He will protect us. He will feed us. He will love us. He will take care of us. And this is what, he, this is what David says. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. People have sat in rubble, in brokenness and in the midst of painful and hard weeks for a very long time. And our God, listen to me, our God is a God who has been faithful for generations. He has rescued people from brokenness and rubble Four generations. You will not be excluded from his plan and his dream. Joy is a belief that God is good. God's not after you. God doesn't want bad things for you. Our God is good and his love endures forever. There is nothing, listen to me, there is nothing you can do to make God not love you. You are loved. You are loved. Joy comes from knowing you are loved and you belong. It is grounded in gratitude. Did you hear what David said? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. I had nothing to offer God, and I simply thanked him for being my God, for letting, him be, for letting me be a sheep in his pasture. It is grounded in gratitude. If you don't have a practice where you are constantly thinking about what it is you're thankful for, joy might feel like it's not able to be reached. Joy is grounded in gratitude. And joy is grounded in a belief that our life is not our own. It is God's. We are His people. And He is our God. And if you feel like you've been robbed of joy, I'm just going to ask you really quick this morning to think about what else has been trying to claim your life and your heart. What else has been trying to claim your life and your heart this week? We are gods. Our life is not our own. We're going to mess it up every time. David knew this, right? And he said, please listen to me. Have joy and be thankful. Shout every single day for joy to the Lord. Because it will remind you we are not our own. We are God's. Chris is sitting on the front row like, I hope she's listened to herself preach this week because it's been a week at our house, right? Um, I want to share a story with you. I thought that um, they would be here this morning, but they are not. But for six months, um, well, a little over six months, two little girls have walked into our church every Sunday. Their names are Lily and Luna. This is literally the first Sunday I think they've missed in six months. They have blonde hair. They're twins. They are super cute. Um, You'll have to come back next week because I'm sure they'll be here. They stand right up here in the morning and they twirl in dresses during the first part of our songs. They twirl and dance before they go to Horizon Kids. They smile and they laugh. They giggle. Sometimes they scream and make a lot of noise, but I love it. I'm here for it. This is church, right? This is what Ezra says. So it's to be a little interactive. Um, They are wonderful, wonderful young girls, and we are so excited they've been a part of our church. What you don't see, what you haven't seen, is the court dates that they've had before they walked into this room or into rights. You didn't see the years, the years in foster care. You didn't see the delayed permanent solution over and over and over again. You didn't see a guardian ad litem woman who took work off to advocate in court on their behalf. What you didn't see is the people that they call mom and dad who had fostered children over and over again. You didn't see their mom and dad have a little boy for over a year who was then reunited with his birth mom. 
which is a good and celebratory thing, but they loved him like their own for over a year. You don't see the phone calls, the emails, the changed court dates, the school stuff, etc. What we saw every Sunday was a family full of joy. A dad, Drew Glasser, the calmest, most peaceful and loving human I have ever met. He wrangled the radiant energy of those two girls and Annie, honestly, <laughs> the mom, as they come in to church every day, just so calm. What, what we didn't see is one of the strongest and most helpful humans, Annie Glasser, walk in the door and then stay late as the little girls ran and twirled around in their dresses as she cleaned up this space, laughing and giggling with us, even with the weight of not knowing what the future hold. And what some of y'all didn't get to see because you aren't the pastor of this church was that this Friday was their official adoption day. Can I get an amen? Amen, right? God took the rubble and the crumbled up lives of little girls and a mom and a dad and he restored and rebuilt their lives. And I got to participate in the feast that was adoption day. I had a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, but the girls had uh, sprinkle cookies and chocolate milk, right? Good feast. I loved it. Um, and as we ate breakfast and we feasted together, there was a moment where I was like, this day is holy. It is set apart. As I watched with my own eyes, God rebuilt and restored this family, these young girls. And I just have to ask you, do you need more fun and joy in your life? God has the solution. It is not... It is not ignoring that there is rubble and pain and brokenness in our world, but it is believing that we worship a God who has the solution to it. A God who is going to rebuild walls and cities and lives in our lives like we could never imagine. We believe God has the solution. Quit believing the lie that you have to choose between having fun and living your life. You can live your hard life and still experience the strength and joy of the Lord. Look around this room. Look around this room. Look around this room. <laughs> Y'all are not being interactive. Look around this room. There are people who love you, who will cling to the promises of God when it is not something you can do. Because every single Sunday in the Christian tradition, these are little feast days. They are days that we set apart in our lives where we celebrate the good things God is and has and will do in our lives. Amen? And there are going to be days in the middle of rubble that you sit in here and you can't hardly think about taking one more step forward and somebody here is going to take your hand, be in the arms and feet and hands and love and heart of Jesus and they are going to drag you the next step. And there's going to be a day when God uses you to do that because... Like Ezra said, we know this truth. There are people out there who have no idea what it's like to have enough food. And so we are going to figure out in this church how to feed them. There are kids at Sheremonte Elementary School that have no idea there are adults who love them. So we've got 12 people ready to go to let them know how much they are loved. There are people who don't have money to wash their laundry. There are things and people hurting. And the joy of the Lord that we get here will be our strength in rebuilding, restoring the hope and love of God in the lives of people. Amen? Some of you are sitting here this morning and you have never ever taken the opportunity to believe in that God. I want to offer you a second to come and pray with me or Chris in the back. We want to help you on this journey of claiming the joy of the Lord as your strength to take a step on that journey to let God rebuild the rubble and hard things in your lives. If, if you've never done that, in just a few moments, Chris and I are going to be in the back, and we'd love a second to pray with you. Well, the rest of you pray with me this morning also. God, I thank you so much for being a God who restores and rebuilds. Whatever rubble is laying here in the ground, I pray, God, that there is some amount of joy and celebration that you have allowed this morning anyway. We are in your courts this morning with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for Lily and Luna Glasser, for, Chad, for Drew and Annie. We give you thanks for the opportunities that we have to celebrate and spread your joy in a world desperate for it. We love you 
And we thank you so much for loving us. Amen.